Hello, everybody. How are you? It is so good to see everyone. I know that not everybody is here yet because I forgot to put a placeholder, but hopefully they'll be here soon. So, hello. I can't believe it's already February. What is that about? <laughs> so, it is so good to see Barbara here. Hello, Miss Barbara. Hello. So, we'll wait a couple minutes and let other people up oh, here. Here we go. We've got Dolores coming in. Annette, yay. Oh, hello, Annette. I'm still using my Elna right now. I think of you often because I keep thinking I really should sell it. Right now, my other Juki is in the shop again. Okay. Oh, good. People are coming in. This is wonderful. Hello. Brenda's here. Hi, Brenda. Thank you for all those pictures. That was terrific. But let me tell you the story of the machine. So I was doing that seascape with the painted background and just the sea grasses. And I was using heavy thread through my needle, which probably wasn't a good idea. And I accidentally broke my needle. Well, on a computerized machine, when that needle's going down, it tries to go down. And so even when the needle breaks, it's still trying. So it threw off my timing. So I took it into the shop. It was right before I was going to go to Myrtle Beach quilt party. Took it into the shop. And it is so good to see Cheryl. Took it into the shop and had him work on it. So I went to pick it up last Tuesday. I th yeah, last Tuesday from the shop. Mark said, good, good reasoning that he always uses Deb, why don't you try it out and make sure it's fixed? Oh, no. I it's, it's fine. <laughs> I was busy trying to get ready for last week's landscape. So here comes Friday morning. I'm taking a class for Mancuso from Bonnie Langenfeld. I start to get ready to sew real quick. And it gets all tangled under my bobbin. So I was like, oh no. So Mark came down, got my other Juki, brought it upstairs. And that's why my Elna is sitting right here with me. In fact, I'll show it to you. She's my workhorse. I've had her for a good number of years. And here she is. She's the Elna's Quilter's Dream Pro. And so I do love her. Um, and she's got thread cutter and all that. And you know what? She hardly ever broke down. <laughs> but I wanted a, a couple little whiz-bang features. Well, when you get whiz-bang features, guess what? They break easier. <laughs> but anyway, so I went, so I tried the machine later after the stress of getting ready real quick for the class. And what was happening is every time I would push the auto scissor cut, the thread would get all hung up under the machine. So I wrote to my machine repair person. I sent him a text and said, machine's still not working right. Can I bring it back? And he said, bring it back this week. Well, I took it back in there and he looked at it and he said, oh, I was supposed to tell you I couldn't fix the scissor cutter thing. So I was like, oh, so I drove 45 minutes just to hear it can't, you know, he can, he doesn't know how to fix that. Something's off with it. So anyway, I thought, okay, the good news is I first was thinking I drove 45 minutes for nothing. I still don't have a machine I can use unless I'm willing to forego the auto thread cutter and Hey, that's why I bought the machine. <laughs> this one has it too. But I bought that one because it has the presser foot when you stop sewing partially lifts up. And since I do a lot of thread painting and sketching, I wanted that feature. But the good news is, if you remember, well, let me just show you this while I'm here. When I was at Myrtle Beach, I bought this pack of gorgeous fabric. And it's three sisters. It looks a lot like French General. And I've been wanting that for a while. Well, remember I told you. Let me show it to you again. I told you it only has one blue. Well, 
blue is my signature color. So I had to have more blues. So I had to, that line is out of print and you can't get any more. So I went to Etsy and I found this half yard of this wonderful blue. And then I want my background to be off white. So I found this with blue and the off white got that. Well, when I went the other day and couldn't get my sewing machine fixed, they had the three sisters fabric in the store. So I got a yard and a half. <laughs> I got a yard and a half of that. Oh, good for you. Oh, good for you, Annette. Good for you. So, and I hear people love their jazz. So anyway, um, I'm excited about this. I think that I'm going to start a Sunday block of the week or block of the month. Probably a block of the week. We'll see. But I've been collecting some wonderful Civil War era um, 19th century block patterns. And so I will have them for all of you if you want to try it with me. But I'm very excited about that. So, once I found the Three Sisters fabric that's no longer in print, then I wasn't so sad that I had to drive 45 minutes for nothing. So, to make a long story short, <laughs> I'm good with long stories. I then stopped by a big sewing center here called Tidewater Sew and Vac. And lo and behold, when I went inside the store, they carry Jukies. They are an authorized Juki dealer. Well, hello. So on the way home from not being able to get it repaired, I dropped it off at the new place. And they said it'll probably be two weeks before they can get to it. But I asked them specifically. I have a Juki DX7. Does your guy know how to fix the automatic thread cutter? And he said he did. So we'll cross our fingers and then hopefully I can get it back. But I'm going to ask about, I think that using a thread that's a little too thick was not a good idea. So anytime if you're dealing with decorative threads that are thick, try hand winding them on the bobbin and then just do your work upside down. And one of these weeks. I don't know if it'll be this weekend, but maybe next weekend. I'll show you what that's like. You just have to make sure that you draw the pattern on the back of the quilt and do it reversed of how you want it. See, because you're doing, you're working upside down. And that way the bobbin, the decorative thread from the bobbin will be on the front once you turn it over. So we will work on that. But this coming weekend... We're going to do a little bit more with the half square triangles. And I found this chart on the internet that I like doing eight half square triangles at a time. This tells you if you want a finished two inch half square triangle, what size fabrics do you need to make eight at a time? So I will save this for Sunday and share it with you. So. Jody's here too. So let me see all who is here real quick because I talked a lot about the sewing machine. All right. So Barbara, Dolores, Annette, Brenda, yay, Debbie, Cheryl, Laurel, Laura, and Jody, and Barbara Smith. Oh, did I already say Barbara? I said Barbara Smith twice. Well, that's because Barbara Smith is special. So, I want to talk to you first tonight about taking the class from Bonnie Langenfeld. And I took it on Friday at the virtual class, this virtual schoolroom. They released the classes for May. I've already got two in my basket, so I've got to decide between the two. But if you're interested in learning, taking a wonderful class from National Favorite special teachers, qualified teachers, and all you pay for is the class unless they require a kit. You don't have to pay for parking. 
You don't have to pay for gas to travel. You don't have to pay for hotels. You can take it at home in your pajamas. So it was wonderful to take the class. That's my second class from her. And, oh, there you are, Robin. Yes, I forgot to put a placeholder. I've been a little scattered lately, but I forgot to put a placeholder. So I got it done late. But anyway, I took another class from Bonnie Langenfeld. And here is that quilt that I made in Bonnie's class. Now, she was teaching the individual stitching styles. So most people didn't get the actual quilt done because she had them practice on a buckram. Oh, I don't, I thought I might have brought it, but I'm not sure where it is. But it is a heavy fusible interfacing, and they call it buckram. They call it other things, text, something, text. But anyway, she likes to do that because then it makes it easy to do the thread sketching on your domestic machine. But all of the tree leaves are thread. And I'm very happy with it. I did a much better job this time. It was nice taking the class a second time. I'm working on shadow, as you can see around the base of the tree. I'm working on shadow. I'm working on contrast and working on depth perception. So it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of thread. So, I wanted to make sure you know, there are so many different ways of doing landscapes. And I've taken classes from at least four different people, and they each have their own style. And my style is a little bit of each one of theirs. And so that's what you need to find, to be happy with landscape. Um, quilting. You need to find your style. Now, I don't think Bonnie does as much thread painting in the background as I did. Um, so that is a good thing. But I lack patience. And I have so many things I want to do. It's hard to take the time to do this much thread painting. And it uses a lot of thread. My style of landscape quilting, because what she does, she picks, like there's, this is one fabric, one fabric, one fabric, one fabric, and then three fabrics. So it's, it's not many pieces of fabric, okay? But what my favorite style is collage landscape, where I hit it with all kinds of fabric and try to let the fabric do the work. Now, she lets the fabric do the work too. She loves picking um, batiks, models, marbles, anything with like flowing patterns. And she specifically cuts the fabric to try to look like background, foreground, to have it do the shading, like the mountains. I changed all my fabric once I started her class Friday because I had forgotten that she does that. And I had just picked colors. I came back down during the first break of the class and said, pick, pick tech. Pick textures. And what I mean by that is pick a fabric. Like instead of picking this, pick this. And there's several reasons that I'll get into in a moment. But then she uses, like for the trees, instead of putting um, greens to make a leafy look, this is all thread sketching. All of that is thread sketching with three different colors of thread, dark, medium, and light, making sure that each one has its own value. Don't get them too close alike because then you're just wasting your time. So everything that she does, three dark, medium, and light, and make sure there is a contrast between each of those shades. So anyway, 
But this was a lot of fun and I will do this. I will remember these things and use these skills um, in the future. So it's a very good thing to do. I personally would like to use more fabrics, cut them. So where I need a shadow, cut a fabric that's the color of the shadow. So I like doing lots of fabric. And I'm lucky enough after 30 years to have a pretty good stash. And that's another thing. I will show you what I buy for a stash because that makes a big difference. Now, there are some people who just do a very simplistic, do a curvy strip landscape and let just the, the, the simple beauty of the fabric come through. So that's another kind of landscaping. There are some kind of there are some people who do heavy painting on the fabric. That's a different kind. So there, there's a style for just about everyone. But some things that are your basics are a sky is lighter at the horizon and gets darker on the way up. And then your colors are more vibrant in the begin in the front, in the foreground, and get less vibrant, more gray-like, and actually lighter. That's why I chose the back. It's kind of covered right now, but I chose the back one, a lighter olive. And I just wanted to choose this dark one here. But normally, as you look at something, the atmosphere is between you and distance. And that tends to put like a gray filter on everything. And it minimizes the vibrance of the color. So I kind of broke some of the rules here. But I just wanted... I just wanted to do that. <laughs> and you can, as long as you understand that. But see, with the fabric, with the with the, the fabric in the field, it's a vibrant green. Then I chose a two-tone, duller green. And then I used a golden green for the way back. So these, by using these three colors, it gives some distance to the fabric. And then with the water, I had just picked a blue. I came back and picked a blue striation. It was an ombre with striated like layers. And that was good because then I could pick a light at the top to act like it was reflecting the sunlight off of it. Making sure too, when you get ready to do your landscaping, you decide where is your source of light, the sun, where is it coming? And that way you have to make it consistent. So now, after talking about that, I'm going to bring this forward. Now, I don't have, I have a lot of fabrics down here, but I don't have everything because I had to kind of, I wanted to make sure I was organized. And I've done most of the, of the blocking in of color. Now, I bought a little piece of this. Because for rocks, it has big enough rocks, I can cut some out and put them on my piece. But normally, I wouldn't get that. You see all the white in the background? That would be very hard to use to make it look realistic. Thread sketching with double needles, I have never done that. I've never used double needles in my life. So that would be a first for me. And knowing me, I'd probably break both of them. <laughs> Hi, Karen, you're never late. And I'm so glad Robin found us. So, and Robin, I think you're already a member, but if you're having trouble getting in, I will definitely check it after the show with two different colors. Sometimes I, I've heard of people doing that. Sometimes I'll use a variegated, but you got to be careful too with variegated because the light means it's in the background and the dark means it's up front. And you never can quite, determine where it's going to come up in a field of grass. Yeah, that's great. As long as um, it's like a mixture right in front of you, but you just have to be careful with variegated. They, they can have their place in the right, like for water, you can use them in water and how 
Bonnie Langenfeld does water is she puts drops feed dogs. This one, I drop the feed dogs. It works so much better. I used to be afraid of dropping the feed dogs because when you drop your feed dogs, the fabric doesn't move through the machine. You have to move it. So that means when you start sewing, you've got to know what motion, how you're moving. And that worried me a little, but I did it and did it fine. Also, the other thing when you're thread sketching, the faster you push your pedal down, the faster the needle's going, the easier it is to, to move the fabric under the needle and probably less chance of breaking the needle. Because if you, if you are just have your, have the motor of the machine going slowly, it kind of drags. When you put that foot down on the pedal, then you can just, it practically floats. So do remember that. And I think it's just because if you're sewing faster, there's more time that the needle's out of the fabric. So it makes it easier to move the fabric around. All right. So this is not something I would say, run out and buy that. Okay. Now this is a better one. If you want some rock fabric, this is better. The reason this is better is because it's more muted. It's not as definite. But she, Bonnie Langenfeld, showed fabric that had clouds on it. But when I have to worry about how to sew the fabric in blocks, piecing, whoops, I hope, am I, somebody let me know if we're still here. The computer said it had to do something. I don't know. But anyway, but, oh, I see my, my, internet's kind of going back and forth but um she showed clouds and on one cloud it had a shadow down here and it had the highlight here and then the one just to the side of it it was reversed so the shadow was on top and the highlight was on the bottom how do you use that fabric without it looking wonky so she prefers actually not using definite clouds, using a mottled or a striated or an ombre fabric to suggest it. So it's up to you, but just pay attention to those things. And also, what if you need small rocks and this is all you have? Not good. Oh, thank you, Laura. That's probably right. So a muted, then your eye doesn't focus on it. When you have this fabric, your eye looks at every single rock. This is so muted, all you think is rocks. So see the difference? So I have found I buy lots of fabric like this. Now, if you're a piecer, you're going to think this is the ugliest fabric I've ever seen. But if you're a landscape person, that is beautiful. Okay, here's another one. I look at fabric so differently now than I ever did before. This, I do believe, is a Jenny Buyer. I, I bet I might be wrong, but look at this. That is wonderful because it can be rocks. It can be trees. It can be earth. It can be a lot of things, and that's, it could even be... um like barn siding. So what you do is start looking at fabrics. Now here is one, and you know it's supposed to probably be grass, but it's not definite. So you could turn it any way you want, and you could still use it. This could be the fabric in the background, and you could have taller grass up front and shorter do shorter thread sketching in the back, and it would just give you the tones, the tone on tones, okay? Now, let me see. I'm going to find some more in here that I like. This was a wonderful ombre that I got a few years ago, and I liked it because it went from light to very dark, and I've used all of the very dark parts. I love batiks with models and dots and bubbles and things. Here's some more of a lighter shade of that marbled batik. Here is, and I'm pretty sure this is a desk. This is a Jenny Buyer. 
but look at the texture. This is great in the woods. This is great. It could be even grass and you can do thread painting over it. And it's not specific, but it gives some light and dark, some movement and, and color. This was a wonderful one. I don't know what fabric this is, but I love that. You can turn that from old building siding to rocks to just about anything. This one is really cool because I want to put a moss look on some of my rocks. And I could easily go in and get some of the more faded, the, the, the softer edge part, and make that look like rocks on stones. Here's another one that's a great one. So when I say get landscape fabric, I don't necessarily mean go get grass and flowers and houses. No, I want you to make it yourself. This is wonderful. As you can see, it's been making rocks already. All right. Here is another one. This is my gravel fabric. And these aren't meant to be landscapes. They're just these are just, they call blenders. But look at this one. That makes a wonderful beach or dirt path. I made my dirt path, I believe. Out of, yeah, I think I made my dirt path out of this one. These can make gravel, sand, rocks. So when you look at a fabric, try to find something that gives you a lot of possibilities. That's what you want. If you buy everything so specific, you're not going to have possibilities. You're going to have one use fabric. Here's one of the petites with the dots. This is wonderful. This is going to help me do my submerged rocks. Here is a fabric that could be a stone wall or it could be tree bark, depending on how you use it. I love this fabric because this looks like you can turn it, this into great rocks. So, um, now I do end up buying some fabric that looks like trees. And here is a light part of one of the batiks. I do buy some fabrics that look like trees, but I use them in all kinds of ways. This has green in it. This makes wonderful, turn it this way, and it makes wonderful mossy rocks. Turn the back of it, and you can do a tree from the distance. So just it's all in how you look at your fabric. Here is another. Now, see, these, you wouldn't buy these to just do piecing, but these are wonderful, and these are usually the fabrics. I'll give you a hint. These are the fabrics that don't usually sell that well, and so they're often on sale. And that's perfect for me because you know how cheap I am. Look at this wonderful fabric. I'm pretty sure this is a Jenny Buyer. This can be so much depending on what part you use, on which direction you turn it. And it's wonderful. It gives the shadows look. If you don't want to cut up a zillion and a half pieces of fabric, it's nice to have one that's marbled because you can get your shadows and your highlights in the same fabric. This is a Jenny Buyer. And it's wonderful because it can become tree bark. It can become rocks, deep shadows. Oh, I love this fabric. I would love to buy more of this. And it was one of those fancy um, ombres and it's um, batik. So each side, look at that. Each side is usable. But isn't that wonderful? And look at the striations. All of that, you want something going on in that fabric. You don't, I hardly ever, ever use solids. Now this, you would say, Deb, that's ugly fabric. No, it's not. It's amazing fabric. It is amazing. And as I show you my quilt tonight, you'll get a chance to see these in action. Look at this. There's a whole lot you can do with that. 
So, and, and, and these are out here because I'm going to use them. Now, here is a fabric that is not in any way a landscape, but it's modeled and it has movement. And I had an area of the rocks that looked like they had striations. Boom. There it went. All righty. Even something like this. So look for movement, non-specific designs. Movement, lights, and darks, and non-specific. Now, you can use a calico if you want. The rules are the only the ones you set up for yourself. Now, this looks like, would look like, oh, that's tree bark, but it's kind of big. But... That's too big to use for a little tree, but what if you cut down this stripe right there? What if you used a thin piece of it from the back? So what happens is trees are all different colors and especially depending on if they're in the foreground or the background. And that's why you need all the different fabrics. Here is a baskety type. It looks like grass cloth. Very, very useful for sand, dirt, siding, roofing. This is a Jenny Buyer, but it's wonderful. Like if you were to cut out like right there, it would be a wonderful rock with the shading, with the highlight and shadow already built in. So, oh, here's one more. I'm hoping you're getting an idea. This is wonderful because what is it? I don't know. Maybe it was supposed to be cheetah fabric or something. I don't know. But what is wonderful about it is it is not specific and it's not definite in your face. It's a little more muted and mixed up. Wonderful. All right, now I do have a couple and I do use them. I do have a couple of these traditional landscape fabrics, but you notice it's not specific. It gives lights and darks and it looks like it might be grass, but it doesn't go, you know, it's not a definite grass. So you can use this in a forest for sunlight coming through a tree. Where you cut it depends on the look you get because it has light areas and dark areas. Now this was not a landscape fabric, but it's been one of my workhorses. I'm not sure what the design is, but it's wonderful if you want a more subdued green. Because remember, Everybody knows it's easy to buy the lights and the darks, but don't forget those mediums because most of life is a medium. So I, this was one of my new ones that I bought and I love it. It looks like a bunch of treetops, but I will show you how in the bush that I made, I specifically cut some of the designs to look like shadow and highlight. Um, here is another one that you wouldn't normally think. This does a great job cut in small pieces to look like rock. Ombres are always good. You can get all the different shades. Here is wonderful blue for water. Here is a what? See how it's not too specific. In some areas you can see a flower, but in some areas it's just modeled. Great for shadows. Okay. Um, if I were to get a rock print, this is one I would recommend. And the reason is it is pretty non-directional and it doesn't have any back white, I mean, white in the background. They just go from rock to rock to rock. And that's where I tell you, it is not so specific and it's, it's more muted stone. So, um, sometimes I do buy this. You would say this is fall leaves, but it's not too specific. 
you can't see an entire whole leaf. But this would allow me not to do confetti, which would be nice. I could just cut this and cut it in branch shapes like this, you know, cut it in branch shapes and then layer it on. So, and there are times when you could use something like this and it could be leaves and the swirls would help it to be leaves. But I'm hoping I'm just giving you ideas. If you want to do landscape quilting, my recommendation is you buy fat quarters, quarter yards, or half yards at the most. I save one yard purchases for sky fabric, for water fabric, um, and greens, like batik greens, things you know you're going to use a lot of. But I, I mostly buy quarter fat quarters and up to a maximum of half yards. So, because what you want to do your landscape quilting is I, what I like is having lots of choices. Whoops. And I don't want to mix these two bundles together. I like having lots, lots, lots of choices. And I will show you that and what I've done on my quilt tonight. Trying to think of what, okay, hopefully I've done this right. I have two piles, the piles I'm done with, the pile I'm still might use. All right, this is the inspiration photo that we're using. Now, when I'm upstairs working on this, what I do is I bring the inspiration photo into my Word program so I can make it as big as possible and I leave it on my computer and I refer to it as I'm working. I'm getting close to using, you can use fabric markers, which are cheap or ink tints or actually anything you want. I'm not gonna wash this. I never wash my art quilts. And so if I wanted to use, if I couldn't afford ink tints and wanted to use regular colored pencils, do it. Crayons, do it. And something like a crayon, what I would do then is take a clean cloth that you don't need, like muslin, and iron over, put it, lay it on top of the crayon, iron it. That takes out the excess oils and color, so that's good. And I use textile medium. There are so many different kinds of fabric medium, textile medium. I use that with all of my ink tints because it helps set the color and helps it bond to the individual fibers. All right, so let's come over here. Uh, this, this week, I got a partial order in. Y'all won't believe this. I'm going to get ready and start some perennial flowers for the garden. But I also saw a bunch of these glue sticks. And it was 12 glue sticks for $4.99 or 5 dollars you know something like that so I said I'll get those and then I was looking for tacky glue and you know me I'm so cheap I look for the best deal well the best deal was a pack of six for ten dollars which gave me 12 ounces versus eight ounces for eight dollars so always I use that little calculator and find the very best deal all right so let me move these things and let me, ah, all right. Last week, I thought I could lay all, cut all the pieces, lay it out, then take it off and show you how I put it back on. I still haven't figured that back out yet. So, but this time I told you I wanted to try to have as much of it done as possible. Well, I'm not fully done, but I'm getting there. Here, I took a piece of golden threads paper and I drew the pattern, okay? And if any of you want the pattern, I can, let me real quick, let me come on here. Um, here we go, okay? Our, whoops, need my glasses, okay. 
our time. Whoops, no, not or. Okay. Oh, where is that you? Our, our time. Whoops, time to quilt at twc.com. If you send me an email, I will send you out the pattern. The pattern comes to you by email as four copy machine size, normal size pages. And they're numbered and you just take and you tape them together and then you'll get that pattern right there. All right. So this time, the past few days, oh, here is the, whoops, don't want to lose that. I'm probably planning on using it. Here is that buckram weight. I used two layers of this when I took um, the class from Bonnie Langenfeld, but it's just really thick. She uses something, something text, T-E-X. -T All right, let me move this tray and I'll bring you here. Now, last week I said, Normally, people say work from the top down. Well, last week, I had a hard time getting myself into it. And so I wanted to work from the bottom up. And I did. Then when I took everything off and couldn't figure out how to put it back on, guess what I did this week? Whoops. Now, what did I just drop? Probably something I'm going to need. All right. Whoops, I think it could have been a marker. Everything. <laughs> Some things are just sticking on here by goodwill. So, <laughs> by good behavior. All right, here is what I've gotten done this week. All right, so... I'm trying to give you more time to see it because sometimes I'm too quick with it. Now, this is color blocking. So at, this is just getting your colors where they belong. So don't worry if it doesn't quite look right. Do, do, do not worry if it doesn't quite look right because... It will go through an awkward stage and then we'll pull it back together. And it won't really look its best until we get busy with ink tents and thread painting. Okay? So now I'm going to move that down and bring you in here. Let me move the iron. I don't think I need my iron right now. All right. Here we go. Now, if I had numbered all my pieces and my places, then last week I would not have had trouble. Whoops, hold on. I would not have had trouble um, putting things back in place. But I didn't think about that. Let me make sure I don't have it on. Whoops, don't do that, Deb. Let me see. Okay. Come on, touch screen. Yay. All right. So here we are. Okay. Oh, and Dawn, don't worry. When you do your landscapes, you will reach stages where you say, I don't like it. What is wrong with it? Nothing's wrong with it. I promise. I promise. And it's something that you will look at and you will change over and over and over. I probably have a couple hundred pieces of fabric on this puppy. So let me tell you a few things about it. I start out with muslin and I iron fusible interfacing on the back, giving it some body. I starch it. Then I draw my pattern on it and then halfway follow it. I kind of like peek under, but as you glue stuff on it, you can't see that anymore. That's why it's nice to have a piece of golden threads paper with the pattern on so you can bring it down. You can bring it down like this and go, oh yeah, there is my, there's my waterfall right where I drew it. Uh, in fact, 
this one comes down a little. But now, just so you know, this will not look like yours because I've used a little artistic license. Free time, first time free motion. Ah, drop your feed dogs. It really does work. I've always been shy about it. But here is, I first cut this tree out of this fabric on the right side of it and realized it was entirely too big, made the tree kind of like come forward. So I didn't waste that fabric. It then became a rock. So that's why I love these fabrics. And you'll get a chance to actually see. Oh, I know what it was. No, no, here are my scissors. All right. And you will be cutting threads here and there. And when I'm done put blocking the color, I will take invisible thread, a good monopoly. This is a YLI monopoly. And I also love superior threads monopoly. And I will take and zigzag across all my fabrics. And on the dark fabrics, I'll use the smoky version. But that way, everything will be held down. Right now, I have either used a glue stick or the tacky glue. If you use tacky glue, don't expect to pull it up. <laughs> tacky glue holds really hard. So in that case, especially if you're new to this, please let me give you a hint. Use school glue, okay? Use school glue. All right, I'm going to bring you down here further and show you. All right, I put some blue here and then came in and cut little bits of fabric. That's the only sky that is on this whole piece, okay? Then I took, here are two different colors of tree fabric because here the sun is shining on it, here it's not. And see, if you just cut like that, and then you can come in. Now, Bonnie Langenfeld said she doesn't use the purple glue sticks because the purple doesn't always go away. But you know what? I would only worry about this if I was using the white fabrics. But this has so many different layers. Now, these are all my boulders and rocks. And they, they look a little bit flat right now. Do not worry because I will come in with markers ink tents and thread and um and i will bring those to life all right so i've added a couple i've moved a tree around added a couple trees don't worry up here i even used a black fir tree that was more deeper into the forest and i love making giving distance by putting fabric over it, or in this case, I just sliced this branch fabric and tucked the tree under and then put it down and glued it. And I, But that really helps give the tree some depth. This light fabric is here because of... Oh, good, Dawn. Good, good, good. That stuff really helps. Miss Judy Lilly is the one that taught me that. And you can pin it to the top of your quilt when you're placing these things. And that way, I think, yeah, there we go. Look what I just did. I brought that to the top because anytime you can have leaves come over top of something, you've instantly given it depth. And I hope I was, let me see. Let me bring this here. All right. And... All right. Now, I haven't had any problem with the purple school glue, the sticks, you know, staying purple. But like I said, if you're worried, don't use it on very light fabrics. But this is a chartreuse. Then this, see these fabrics, they aren't landscape fabrics. They're just modeled and all that. But like this is another piece I put on top of another piece on top of that piece on top of this piece. I have many, many layers. And that's the way I like to do mine. But you don't have to do it that way. So you see a difference between this style landscape with fewer fabrics and 
this, what I do is, is the collage. So it's like taking layers and layers and adding things onto it. I even wonder if I should bring one of these rocks. Well, I'm thinking I should bring this rock in front of the tree. Let me uh, see. And that's why when you, you might, I might send you a pattern but do it the way you want to. Make it your own because everyone sees stuff a slightly different way. Now, what I'm going to do, let me get this fabric because I like showing you some of my processes so that you can see nothing stays the same. So I'm going to cut this loose because it was a little bit, it was glued down pretty, pretty solidly. All right. Here we go. Now let's look at what that did. That's a small little thing, but watch. Now, do you see the tree? Do you see the difference between it just standing there and now it's hidden by a boulder? See that? So these are just little ways that you can build up texture because I have rock going behind already, and but this one, and I'm tucking it below the water. Now, I don't know if I'm going to leave this water like that, but I found green batik fabric that had a wonderful reflective like look. And this is up into the woods. So this is this area right here. There's a lot of moss in it. And it's kind of a greeny brownie. So I, that's where I brought this in. And here is the mossy shadows. This, these right here, this is this, this area of stone. And I had to do a lot to get. If you look at the area of the leaf cover, that's a lot. And you want it to look have some depth. Now, it, I, I think this is a stone, a huge boulder, or somebody turned it up on its side. I do not have this in my drawing, but it's entirely up to you what you want. And as you can see, I put in this tree. I moved the main tree is over this way a, a little touch more. This is supposed to be a bush, and I did this right before I finished. What happened is I used a single piece of fabric for the background. See this shrub right here, or a small tree? They had a darker background on it. So I can come in. Actually, that's a good thing. Let me show you this right now. I can come in. Hold on, let me get some of my textile medium. I'm going to do more. I'm going to do more of the textile medium with you next week. But I just thought I would show you. The thing I love about ink tents is that it's actual dye. And it's dye in a pencil form. That's why it's expensive. But it's a wonderful product. I'm going to come in here with... I hope this is the dark green. Let me see. Teal. Nope, don't want teal. Leaf green. That's a little light. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come over here and get some bark. Some dark color called bark. And what I'm going to do to try to make this bush stand out, I'm going to come in right behind it and do some ink tints. Okay, so that was the bark. Here comes the green. And these are the things you can do to give more depth to your landscape work. And let me watch what happens. Right now, it's just, it's just like coloring it with, whoops, I didn't have that fully glued down yet. It's like coloring but watch what happens when you put the textile medium on. Now, this the bark is needed because, unfortunately, the green isn't that dark. But now I come back in with the green. And I put a good amount. 
And I only put it right behind the bush right now. Okay, because I'm assuming that up here, like, whoops, let me make sure I have it in, in screen. I'm assuming up here, sun's going to get to it better. But now let's see if this helps bring out the bush. So, because this, this bush right in front was kind of getting lost in all of the greens. But let's see. All right, now, let me now show it to you again. All right, it does work. Now, I'm going to have to blend it a little better, but do you see how bringing the dark down now makes this bush pop out? Now, remember this, too, when it comes to these trees, and I know I said we're going to do this next week, but while I'm right here and doing this, I will get the bark color and I've got to decide where I think the sun's going to be kind of coming this way. So I'm going to put a little shadow on these little trees. Even here, let me put a little shadowing and show you what this does now this is mul this is called a multimedia landscape because i'm going to add i'm going to add these ink tents dyes which is like painting and the nicest thing now is quilt shows have caught up and they are really doing a good job of understanding that our fiber art means you can put everything on it. Now, then for the other side, I'll get my white ink tents and just try to give it a little highlight. Okay, let's try this. Let's try this. Whoops. Well, I know I'm kind of getting off, but I just, while I'm here, I thought, let me just show them. Okay. Now, then I want to come back in over on this side of this one. Give it a little shadow over here. Okay. So, whoops. Yeah. Okay. So, let's see. And keep your brushes, keep your brush cleaned off, too, so that when you get the white, you don't have the bark mixed in. All right, so I have the fabric medium on there, and I'm going to come back. White is really hard to see. In fact, I've already had to buy additional white um, ink tents pencils from art supply stores. But this way you can see a little shadow here, a little shadow. All right, now I'm going to put this camera back up and let you see this face on. Okay. And see if you can see a little more definition. Where, where are they? Hold on. They are right here. Hopefully you can see a little more definition, especially right here with the shadow on this one. And I will take my time. Another thing, do not use too much of the fabric medium. It in, It's an acrylic and it'll get like a plastic layer on. So a lot of times if I feel like I'm using too much, I will take... A paper towel or tissue or, or, or an old rag and I will wipe the excess off because you don't want a buildup of acrylic on there that's going to transform the fabric too much. Now let me do one thing really quickly 
the dark that I added behind the bush, it will lighten up when the fabric dries. But it was looking a little too dark. So I'm going to come in here with some lighter greens. Let me bring back over here. I'm going to come in here with some lighter greens and go back over. All right, right in here. So I'm going to come back over like this. And see how that just brightens it back up? And don't forget, you can let this dry and then approach it again. And if that hasn't lightened it up enough for you, then come back with the white and brighten that right back up. And that way it goes from dark right over top of the bush and helps it blend back in the lighter colors here at the top. So nothing, you know, that, that's the one thing I love about ink tints. You can keep playing with it as long as you don't build up the textile medium, which is an acrylic, because then it'll turn just to plastic. <laughs> but now, see? So what I would continue to do later is do a little bit more blending. You can also do this. I forgot to show you this. You can spray a little water on it like that before it dries. And then watch. Watch what happens. See? So if you get too much added to one place, just wipe it off. Okay? You also bought them. Oh, oh, thank you. I, I just try to give you permission to play. So, all right, let's see. So I've added lots of different layers, trying to get lights and darks. Now, over here, I haven't done much. And I don't know if I'm going to do much in this area because where I'm focusing on is right in here. This is that outside edge. And I really just don't know. It's here. It is on the original. And when I finish putting my big rock here, I'm not sure that I really care to do much more developing of that. I think sometimes it's good to let the quilt tell you that's enough. Like over here, I just kind of, you know, and somewhere I'll come in here and trim this. I always make it bigger and trim it down. And that just helps. But I've got layers and layers, tried varying. What I do is I, now this is a dark copy. Yours on your computer will be lighter. But what I do is what I see on here, I just try to put on my fabric. And I've already, you know, when you, by the time you draw your pattern on there, you'll already know where everything goes. It's just a matter of cutting things out. Oh, thank you, hon. Hi, Michelle the Quilter. But, and Marcia's here. Tim Tex. Thank you, Tina Smith. It's a very thick interfacing, and I think it's she uses a fusible version. Eh, very good. Thank you for knowing that. And she loves that when you're going to do thread painting. But anyway, let me get this rock. I'll be using this, this, this rock right here is just the color blocking of this. I am probably going to come in here with some of the ink tints and like, you know, and come in and, and some of it I'm doing with fabric. Some of it I'm going to paint. It's just basically how I feel. Then with some of these rocks, there'll be striations in them. There'll be some, like, see right here? And then I'll come in, and I'll do this with fabric. I mean, thread, too. I'll come in and maybe put a little highlight here and a highlight right under that shadow mark. And I'm just going to build... This is my world. I can do whatever I want to it. If somebody doesn't like it, that's okay. But it's my world. And I'll keep working on it. 
I'm going to have the color blocking done, I hope, very soon. Let me put these away real quick so I can show you the last couple of things. But look how much dye I took off. Now, understand, you can never take it all off. So still exercise caution when you're using them because if you put too much always come in very lightly and put it on because you can always come back and make it darker but you can't take it all off you just can lighten it so this here is my waterfall right here now I started with first by putting the green layer down because it had kind of a cool look then I found this blue gray fabric right there and look at that. I said, oh, that's cool. And it even had lines on it. So I thought that would be pretty good. But then I said, well, no, I really want, I really want some white on it to really bring out that white. So I just took white fabric and I cut strips. In some places, I did little cuts in the fabric. And I've got to be very careful when I zigzag those down with Mono Poly. But I pretty much look at the picture. Let me show you this. So I look and I saw this right on this rock. I saw that dark indentation. So I came and I put this here. So it's just kind of, I look what I see and sometimes I add more. But I really like this. Then I'm thinking... I will probably come in and use a white acrylic paint to really make it shine. And then look at this to make it bright. Then I might even put this over because that gives it that final. See, I've got dark, I've got medium, and I've got light. Well, when you look at the waterfall, it's fuzzier. See how it's fuzzier? I sure do. You'll do fine, Miss Dawn. You have my email, so if you have a problem with it, please let me know. But look what happens when you put the tool over it. It gives it, and then you could always like twist it or bunch it up down, you know, if you wanted it. In this one, it looks like it comes down pretty smoothly to this white plane. But anyway... I'm really, really enjoying this. This is the part that I did on the bottom before, and I don't know where everything goes, so I'm going to have to take time with it. But this is what I had started with when I worked from the bottom up. So I'm getting pretty close to being done with this. Now, what I'm going to do this week... Let me pin these on so I can show you again. And most of this rock fabric will be covered up. Because I am going, I love making rocks. So I'm going to take all my gray fabrics and stuff. And I'm going to make my own rocks. I'm going to do some thread work to make them look good. I'm going to use ink tents. But I, this has so many rocks in it. And I'm going to make them all. I'm going to make them all. And unfortunately, see this right here? Last week I had this made. Well, I wanted to use that fabric somewhere else and I didn't realize what it was. So I've got to do that again. But let me hold it up one more time. And then I'll tell you what we're planning on for next week. All right. So I will have... I will have all of the color blocking done. So you're starting to, can you start to tell now how it's going to come along? And it's how you see it. It's what you see. And you might change things like I've changed things around here. You might change things too. And it's oh. Okay, make the picture your own. And I did like working from the top down. In fact, I took the bottom and kind of tucked it under like that so I didn't have to worry about it. And it is nicer because if you work from the top down, you're not constantly 
bumping and messing with the fabric pieces. But I put on Vera, one of my favorite English detective series, and I just worked for hours on it. So I'm going to take up all the rock fabrics back up with me tonight, and I'll work on it some more tomorrow. I will have everything blocked in, and I'm going to take and start doing thread painting and ink tints on half of it. That way you can see what does it actually bring in. That way next Thursday, I'm going to actually do ink tents and thread sketching with you so that you can actually see how I do it, okay? And I learned some good techniques again from Miss Bonnie. I She really helped me learn how to move. Mainly, you do straight lines for certain things. You do zigzags with the feed dogs drop. Zigzags just to help you kind of get from here to there. Um, let me show you. The zigzags were used on this path. I wanted to make the shadow on the path. And that's a very loose zigzag. See that? And then to make the path look worn up and around, I did a smaller zigzag. Okay. So the leaves are all done with a zigzag with the three colors. Now I start dark and then do medium and then do highlights. And for trees, remember to do the edges highlighted color because they're sticking out there by themselves going, hey, and you know they're going to pick up the sun. So, and then for the water, you do a, a zigzag with the feet drop, dogs dropped. And you kind of do a zigzag and you go this, then kind of come back a little bit and that. So it's like a zigzag down with this loose zigzag stitch. So now for this little pond, I don't think it's going to have much water movement. So I'm not sure that a zigzag is appropriate on it. One thing I was thinking, and I still want to do this. I want to do the reflection in the water. I want to take and make the reflection, then slice it into horizontal strips, and then offset them. So it looks like the rippled effect. You know how you can do the mountains into the on the top on the lake, exactly what you see there, you put on the lake to show the reflection, but it's you know, any little ripple in the water changes it. So that's one of my goals at some point to do. But this one, the water is pretty still. There's only a little bit. So over here on the water where it's a little bit disturbed, I will do that zigzaggy zigzag. <laughs> so you just take, pretend this is your, you start zigzagging here and you go this way, then you go back this way, and then you go that way. So it's offset. See what I'm saying? Like a lightning bolt. Okay. That's what you do on your water. But, and I'm going to go ahead and do the water that, that tannin. The reason in this, in this photo, the water is very rusty colored. That's because it's come through woodlands. All of the leaves that fall, the water takes the tannin out of the leaves, out of those leaves that have fallen. And that's why the water looks brown. So I'm going to do that because I think it might look a little weird if I did it blue. <laughs> but if you want to add a little touch of green to it, you can do that too. So make it your own. But anyway, all right. I think, do you have any questions? I think I've told you everything I can think of. So do you have any questions? Oh, I'm so glad, Michelle. In fact, when they asked why we were taking the course, I told Miss Bonnie Langenfeld, I said, because I want to be a better teacher to the people that, that come watch my videos. And I want to learn as much as I can so that I can pass that on to you. But the main thing that I think I have to give you is the can-do spirit. You can do this. 
if you can cut out fabric and you can glue and all of that, you can do this. And it's so much fun. And it's cathartic. You know what I was it, it's it's just really, really special. And so I was gonna work on my I was gonna work on my exploding heart quilt. Now I'm torn. Do I want to finish this or do I want to do the exploding heart? I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you for joining me. And just, um, Bonnie Langenfeld uses all-purpose thread. A lot of times she just uses um, Coates and Clarks, which I love too. I sometimes, though, will add the embroidery thread. Sometimes I like a little sparkle. So it's pretty much a personal preference. And, um, but if I know like sunlight, I might use a little sparkle. If, if I'm just doing a rock, I'll probably just keep it a regular all purpose and just use a nice fine thread, white, off white, light gray in your bobbin. I would probably recommend not using white, use a light gray because that way, if your tension's a little off, you won't get little white pokies. So white kind of shows. All right, any other questions? Alex Anderson, yes. She had her surgery, I believe, Monday. Ricky Thames has a YouTube video that he made today to let us know. I think it was today, or, no, yesterday. And they were even asking Alex if she wanted to go home the very day she had a double mastectomy. Smart girl went, no, <laughs> I'm so glad. But she was to go home yesterday. So um, that is good. When I had my surgery, I, I had my kidney removed due to cancer. I was in the hospital four days. And let me tell you what, I wasn't ready to go home, not a single day before. So she's, they said she's doing well. When they did the surgery, they didn't find anything unexpected. Everything was just how they thought it would be on the early test results. And we'll know more when the pathology report comes in in seven to 10 days. So thank you to Ricky Thames for giving us an update because I've been thinking just like with our Miss Jody, I've been thinking about this all week. So thank you for asking. And I think she's doing pretty good. And yeah, she's a spunky thing. I don't know if anybody is as spunky as our Jody, but Alex is pretty spunky. So I think she'll be back and be doing good soon. All right. Well, thank you all of you. Thank you for spending this evening with me. This Sunday, I haven't fully decided what we're doing, but I've got a few ideas and I think it'll be a lot of fun. I'm ready to play and have a good time. Happy February, everybody. So if you, I tell you one thing I want to do, I guess I'd get better get ready and draw up the pattern for it so I can send it out to y'all. All right. And anybody wants to join our group SIO, send me an email to that email address at our time to quilt at twc.com and I will send you an invitation even though it might take a couple back and forths to get to get you actually in but we would love to have you join us so thank you so much take good care of yourselves yes uh, and have a Pepsi Marsha all right thank you so much Take good care of yourself. Do something special just for you. I'm going to go watch Groundhog Day. That's my tradition every February 2nd. I love that movie. So Mark's going to groan through the whole thing, but I'm watching Groundhog Day. So bye-bye. Take good care. See you very soon. Now we're the, there's my, forgot my mouse. <laughs> Take care. Nice seeing you. Bye-bye, everybody.